and uh, we'll start right here. This is Bob Sarl. Bob Sarl has co-directed the film. He's also the man for the hipsters in the room. He's the man behind Sweet Blues, a film about Michael Bloomfield. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> okay, I'll walk around. This guy's standing right next to me right here. Tell Laura I love her, be my baby, baby I love you, and then he kissed me, chapel of love, the do ron ron, do ah diddy diddy, leader of the pack, sugar sugar, I honestly love you, and that's tip of the iceberg. Jeff Berry. Yeah. Yeah. And now to my left, this is Jerry Goldstein right here. He's the man behind My Boyfriend's Back and I Want Candy. And here's the cool thing about this guy. He's not just a songwriter and a record producer. Among his productions includes a pretty good little L.A. band called War. Every album, this man produced. The songs, Low Rider, and Why Can't We Be Friends, he co-wrote. Jerry Goldstein. Come on over. Just four chairs to go and we're done. Among many, many others, this man right here has worked with Bobby Darren, Bette Midler, Bruce Springsteen, Carol King, as we know, Van Morrison, Robin Williams, and Adam Sandler. Regarding Van Morrison, there was an album he did that this man was the recording engineer for, which All Music Guide called one of the best albums in pop music history for Van Morrison fans, two words, Astral Weeks. Brooks Arthur. And as you already know, the guy without whom we'd all be sitting at home watching Hawaii Five-O right now. <laughs> as uh, Stevie Van Zandt said, Brett Ben David Burns. <laughs> so it looks like we're only gonna have two chairs. Let's take this other microphone. Jeff, um, you got to tell some good stories in the film, but I'm sure there were a lot that got left out. Fill me in on at least one of them. Um, well, uh, Bert and I were best friends, and uh, it, it wasn't really about business. Yeah, it was Ellie and I were producing Neil uh, Diamond for his label, but Bert and I used to, uh, we had like matching BMW motorcycles, and we'd go on trips, and crazy stuff upstate New York in the rain and one I think I, my bike got a flat one night and I got on the back of his and we ended up at some Italian restaurant upstate New York and if you can imagine that these two soaking wet guys in motorcycle jackets come into this restaurant they wanted no part of us but Bert and I used to play pool all the time at a local pool hall in, in Manhattan and if, if you're Bert's friend and you forgot your wallet and you needed money, he'd give you a hundred bucks, two hundred, whatever, whatever, as I would with him. But if you played pool with him, we used to play a nickel, a ball. And I remember once uh, he won and I owed him a quarter and I had no change. He made me go get change. <laughs> he, he would forget if you owed him a hundred bucks, but he wanted that quarter. He would go, <laughs> Uh, is that a story? That's a very good story. Okay. <laughs> now, Jerry, since you had to deal with those other two guys that were talking next to you throughout the whole film when you were on, uh, since you're now free to speak alone, I'd love to hear one from you as well. I, I have one story when I wasn't with them. And I came into the office one day, and Bert's all freaked out, you know. I go, what's the matter, man, you know? 
He goes, he point, he looks out the window and points, and it's the City Squire Hotel, right? And there is Van Morrison sitting in a window, okay? And he's having a fight, right? He, his girlfriend left, and he's having a fight with Bert, and he's done. He's gonna jump, right? And, and I said, so why don't, how come you don't go over? He says, oh, he'll definitely jump if I go over. You know? So he sends me over, okay? like I know what I'm doing, right? I'm, so I go into the hotel and I go to the desk and I say, there's a guy sitting in the window. We have to, I gotta get into his room because I have, we have to try to stop him from you know, jumping out the window. So the security people come up and they open the door and I say, just stay there. And I knew Van for a little while, you know, not well, but I knew him. And I walk in, he recognizes me, thank God. And I go, uh, so tell me what's going on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually uh, I talk him, out, talk him out of the window and bring him to the office and everybody sort of gets together and he's, he's a happy guy now. So that's one of my solo Burt Burns concept stories. I, w I want to finish the pool cue story, I just remembered. So, um, I lean after I was there the night in the hotel room with, with, when Bert passed on and literally counted the money. I lean referred to uh, Ebony and I literally counted out every dollar so she'd know what she had. But um, I lean gave me Bert's guitar, the one that's in the movie, and I had his and, and his pool cue, which I kept with mine over, for all the years. And uh, many years ago, I was in a little club in Nashville, and a, a young lady came up to me and said, you're Jeff Barry, right? And I said, yeah, she, she was shaking. And she said, you're my godfather. I just hadn't seen Cassie in so long. And uh, I got the guitar, restrung it, cleaned it up, and we met, and I gave her the guitar. And just few, several months ago, right? Um, I mean, it's just nice to wrap it all up in a big circle. I was fortunate enough to be able to give Brett my pool cue and his dad's pool cue. These kids had nothing of their dad's. She has the guitar, he has the two pool cues, and um, that's nice. You want to do the same thing? You got the story got that wasn't in the stories. Okay, two, go ahead. two quick ones, but looking out at the audience, I just want to give all of us here on this side of it a shout out and a huge thank you to everyone. We've come a long way, and suddenly here it is. We made it. You know what I mean? It's a lot of doing. It's just a decade's worth of work. Thank you. You're very welcome. So, Bert loved the way I sang, but then again, I didn't love the way he sang. But, uh, and I was friendly with Freddie Scott from Hey Girl, and we used to write songs together at, at Donnie Kirsten's office. Anyway, at the end of um, Are You Lonesome For Me, Babe? And Freddie couldn't kind of deliver an ending that, was, that would make Bert happy. He said, just keep on singing it. And so I said, Bert, can I take a shot at him with him to show him what he want, what I think you want? And uh, he said, yeah, do it, please, help me. Get, me. get me the F out of this, you know? And um, I suggested to Freddie, I'm coming home, I'm coming home, I'm coming home. And it kept, I said, keep on stair-stepping it, get higher and higher, and just keep on pleading. And uh, that's the way the record went, and Bert was so happy about that moment in time. A confession for me, a quick story, a confession on the, the the bass solo that uh, Eric Gale did on with with a pick on the on the Fender bass. I always thought we we're going to come back and add a solo. <laughs> I'm just waiting. I, I, and was, I said, well, they'll probably get to it tomorrow. But we only had three or four days together with with Van to make that magic moment. And then I was almost about to embarrass myself by saying we neglected to do a solo over the. Uh, where the bass part is, and Gary Sherman said, he just knew that something was on my mind, and he said, and Bert said, and Gary said together, Brooks, that is the solo. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much for my smartness.
I learned a lot today. I just happened to um, hear about this radio show, Jonesy's Jukebox, which is on KLOS at noon, and Brett was on. So I, I learned a lot about Brett today. Uh, <laughs> including uh, Jimmy Page changing your diapers. Which, uh, <laughs> who knew? I, I said it uh, when I thought we were off the uh, air. You know, I said, well, one of my claims to fame, I said, please don't mention that on the radio. And then the radio comes up, so is it true that, you know, and it was like, oh my God, that cat's out of the bag. Well, this is, watching the film, uh, I must say, your mother, Eileen, Wassel, Ellie Greenwich, Joel Dorn, Solomon Burke, Benny King, Jerry Ragavoy, and Wilson Pickett have all passed on since the film was finished. And it makes me wonder, uh, how long did you work on this film? <laughs> Yeah, no, um, it was uh, 10 years ago. I went to uh, see Freddie Scott with Wazel at a, one of those oldies concerts, and I was so excited to meet Freddie. And um, we were hanging out backstage, and I was thinking about this film, and I said to Freddie, you know, I'm going to interview you for this documentary that I just was imagining. And then uh, a few weeks later, uh, he was gone. And it was really like a lightning bolt moment for me. I realized, oh my God, I've got to start interviewing these people. And so I didn't know anything about filmmaking. I just knew you know, to find great people along the way. And we just started shooting interviews. And one by one, people came. You know, We started with people who were close to us, like Brooks. And you know, Joel Dorn came in and said, you know, I've got something I want to say about your dad. And he gave us this interview. And Doug Morris and the people who were, again, closest to me, Wazel, um, you know, and we thought if we could, okay, we can build this thing, and then maybe we can get some of these superstars, you know, and then, you know, Mike Stoller came in, and just uh, Jeff Barry, everybody, you know, these guys, I mean, it really was, a, we got almost everybody we dreamed of getting in this film, um, you know, and, uh, yeah, but, uh, and most of them are still with us, thankfully, but uh, we have... Yeah, including Keith Richards. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll move down here so uh, Bob doesn't have to. Um, I'm going to hand you the mic and tell me how you got involved in all this madness. Well, Joel Selvin, who wrote the uh, definitive biography, uh, is an old friend of mine from San Francisco. And uh, he was doing a, a book reading uh, at, at Book Soup in, in uh, West Hollywood. And I went over to support my friend Joel. And uh, afterwards, I didn't, I didn't know this. I knew that Joel had been working on this book for many, many years. Uh, and afterwards, we all went out for lunch. <clears throat> Joel and a lot of his music journalist friends. And I wound up sitting next to Brett Burns. And uh, we started talking. And he said, I've been working on this film about my dad for 10 years. And I said, well, uh, my wife and I have this little production company. We do a lot of, we produce a lot of music content. If you, you ever need a hand finishing? Uh, you know, here's my number, and he says, "Oh, I've got your number. Selvin's been talking to you up for about five years. He tells me I can't finish my film without you." So that began a, a dialogue that lasted about uh, six months. Eventually, he invited me over to his office and showed me uh, a rough cut that he'd been working on, and I suggested some ways that I thought that we could uh, maybe approach it a little bit differently and and make and, and elevate it to something else. He. He originally told me, he, he thought that maybe he could hire me for a couple months and we could turn it into something that looked like a Ken Burns film, uh, which caused me to reach for my jacket and, and, and say I didn't really have much interest in that. Uh, but if you gave me six months, uh, maybe we could make it look like a Martin Scorsese film. So uh, fortunately he hired me and it was the, one of the best gigs I've ever had. Good job. Yeah. Jeff, uh, speaking of Freddie Scott, uh, one of the songs that you wrote uh, with Bert was Am I Grooving You, and you also uh, wrote uh, I Gotta Go Back for the McCoys, another you co-wrote with Bert. What was it like writing with him? What was, what was your process, the two of you writing together? I, I guess it was, it was like our friendship. We just, it was just natural. He would be on the guitar and uh, out it came. I, I, I never do know where the songs come from. You know, there's a quick story about the, uh, the 
centipede walking along and a spider comes up to him and says, uh, can I talk to you a second? And centipede stops and says, sure. And the spider says, look, I have eight legs and I'm always going like, let's see, the second from the back and the one over there and it's like crazy walking. And he says, you have a hundred legs. How do you do it? And the centipede thought for a minute and never moved again. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. We'd sit down, we'd have a, a shot of tequila or whatever, and he'd pull out the guitar and go, <laughs> and we would write a song. It was... <laughs> I've always wanted somebody to say exactly that. Because I've spent... I was the executive director of the Songwriters Hall of Fame for a few years. I spent a lot of time around songwriters, and every famous song ever written has an incredible story behind how the song came to be. And my entire life, I waited for somebody to say, hey, we just sat in a room and wrote a song. So thank you. I mean, I have a couple of those too, but they didn't involve Bert. So. <laughs> oh yeah, well, on the subject of Jeff writing songs and, uh, and his then wife, the late great Ellie Greenwich, uh, they were a group called the Raindrops. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right, respect. Uh, yeah. They would have had another big hit with that with that group too. It was the song called "That Boy John," but it was released around the time, exactly the time that JFK was shot. And it jumped on the charts in the sixty in, in up sixty something. It was huge. And the next week was off the charts. And then it was off the charts because radio pulled it. But the point I'm trying to make about titles and songwriting, I was so lucky to be so close to Jeff and Ellie. They sort of dubbed me their engineer. And uh, in a matter of uh, minutes, they on one album as the Raindrops, a little known la group and a, and a lesser known label called Jubilee. And lo and behold, they, they wrote songs called Dumb Diddy, uh, uh, Hanky Panky, right. and uh, What a Guy, Kind of Boy You Can't Forget. And on, it was like 10, 10 hits, on, uh, 10 hits for other people on that one album that they did literally in a nanosecond. So we'll talk about titles and songwriting experience. Hey, Brooks, should I tell him about the first day we met? Tell him about the first day we met. Sure, I went to Duke. No, I won't come. No. Tell it, please. Okay. I, I went to a little demo studio called Dick Charles, and it, it was just a quick little demo, so it was in the tiny room. The booth was, I mean, literally six by four. It was, it was like a cell. And there was a new engineer. And um, I mean, I, I'm not a technical guy, but I know you have to plug stuff in. And, and, and this, this new engineer, he, would, he had the thing in his hand and he's looking at what you call a patch bay and you have to plug stuff in. And he's looking at it and his eyes are twirling and I said, you don't know what you're doing, do you? <laughs> and he said, no, he talked himself into the job somehow. <laughs> We, we got through it, and then uh, we opened the studio together in, in, in a couple of years later. At that studio, I might add that uh, we cut uh, Andy Kim, and you had a label called Steed Records. Oh, yeah. Cut a lot of hits up at Little Century Center. Except the Redbird, yeah. The most awkward moment of my life, or one of the most awkward moments of my life, was uh, at Century Sound after... Uh, Neil Diamond left Burt, left Jeff. I had the awkward, but uh, I guess it's still a privilege of sorts. Uh, I got a call from Neil Diamond to do his first recording for Uni Records. We'd cut a song called per Brooklyn Roads, and uh, it made me me very melancholy. Uh, Burt had gone to heaven. And Jeff was warring with with Neil, and there I was behind the behind the controls that with, with a song called Brooklyn Rose. I just thought I'd throw that at you, Jerry. Um, since since you're closest to the microphone, um, the Strange Loves. <laughs> I'm assuming the name came from Doctor Strange Love, which was the big movie at the time. Right. So you wrote I Want Candy for the book. And Strange Love is fun, you know. And we, we didn't even know, you know, we wrote the song that day. And 
you know, I said, wow, now who are we going to get to sing this? And Bert goes, you guys are going to sing this. Are you crazy? We don't sing. You know, oh yeah, you're going to sing it. <laughs> and that's how Bert was, man. He just even saw it in us, and we didn't see it in ourselves. So, you know, he's like, he was an amazing guy. You guys were amazing back then, and you, you guys were churn, you guys were churning out hits, man. You, oh yeah, you were you were crushing back then. Yeah, we were knocking them out, and it was fun. Compared to you know, you could. Oh, this guy. Give this guy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this, these guys were like the real deal, you know. Well, that was the beauty of that era, was there was Lieber and Stoller, yeah. and Jeff and Ellie, and sometimes Phil, the three of you. Um, Man and Wild, Goffin and King. So, I mean, and it, it's all in the same time frame, and in a lot of cases, in the same block. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because uh, LNS and those guys were in the same the, building. Yeah, yeah, in the same building, 1619 yeah. Broadway, and, and then the other. 1650 Broadway. That's where it was all happening. Yeah. So, I'm going to stay with you for a second. Um, I Want Candy is a perfect example of a copyright that has one of those lives that will not die. It's an industry, actually. There, are, there, there are years that we had like four commercials at the same time. You know, one for a candy, one for um, a diamond looking like candy, you know. You, you have the other part, so, you know. Um, candy Crush, which I didn't even know what it was, you know. You know, I thought it was a trick. You know. um, so it became, you know, in one year we had four commercials. The, the, the song makes a fortune, you know, thing. I'm very happy about that. And uh, no, it's just really crazy. Nobody ever knew back then that these songs were going to be like, you know, history. And people would redo them, put them in movies, put them in commercials, you know. It's crazy. Oh, absolutely. Uh, tell we didn't know. Outside of Dick Clark, television didn't play rock and roll. That's right. Uh, the movies didn't play rock and roll outside of the B films that were about rock and roll. Yep. So, so none of us knew that suddenly, come the 70s, 80s, 90s, and now, that it would have a whole new life. And we're all, everybody right. sitting up here is very grateful. <laughs> yeah. Um, Except for Ed Sullivan. He, he was... Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we, and I have an Ed Sullivan story. Go right ahead. Um, I come to the office and Bert's real excited. So we got a call from Ed Sullivan. They want, I want candy. They want the strange loves on Ed Sullivan. I go, wow. You know, the record's top 10. And this would take it number one. You know, and Bobby comes in. He's, this is his dream of his life, right? And Richie comes in and he goes, um, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> he said, we can't do that. I said, what are you, crazy? You know, no, no, we can't do that. So he walks out of the office and I follow him downstairs to, you know, to the bar or whatever, and we sit and talk. He says, uh, I can't do that. I said, why not? He says, my grandmother, right, watches Ed Sullivan every Sunday, right? I'm supposed to be in law school, and she's paying for it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that to her, because it's going to kill her. You know, she, she'll see me there, and she'll go, boom, done. You know, we never did it at Sullivan. And by the way, they came back, and they raised the money, we were going to get the most money anybody ever got. He said, no, we can't do it, Sullivan. And the one thing about Bobby, myself, you know, and Richie, like we're brothers, we do, if one of us doesn't want to do something, we just, and we can't talk him into it, we just don't do it. And that's been 55 years of that. You know, we still own the companies together. You know, I was with Richie in New York last week for the movie. I was with Bobby because War played in Park in, in Miami, and Bobby showed up, and, you know. And that's how we are. You know, but we don't, we're not doing Ed Sullivan. Sorry, Bert, we're not doing Ed Sullivan. <laughs> crazy. But we were, that, we were crazy, so, you know. Yeah, well, you know, I, okay, we've started down this road, so we'll do it. It's just your fault because you mentioned him. But now we're going to have to talk about everybody that's out there. <laughs> I don't know if we have that kind of time, and you know we'll leave somebody out. But... Billy Bear is here, another great songwriter. Oh, yeah. oh, great. So it's good to have him. Yeah, yeah. There he is. Billy's got a new autobiography out. I highly recommend it. And Seymour Stein is here. There are so many people here. Seymour Stein. So, 
I'm not going to repeat that. Um, but I will give you the microphone and you can say what you want. I want you to tell us, Brooks, what it was like to be, once you weren't faking it anymore, what it was like to be in the studio in a Burt Burns session. Uh, and, and think about it in these terms. Was it live? Were there overdubs? Was it a case of you're trying to get three songs done in four hours, or four songs in three hours, rather? Tell me about that era and what you would be doing sitting behind the board. I don't mean to sound like I'm parroting you, but the, it, it was exactly the pattern. The, uh, the business at hand was to nail three to four songs in, in a three hour period. Hopefully not to go over time because we've had very restricted budgets. And uh, the beautiful part about what was happening was that uh, 10 minutes before we were cutting a number one record with live musicians, many of these musicians never saw the song, heard the song, had a clue about the song, and suddenly six takes later or if it goes long, 11 takes later, lo and behold, you've got yourself a smash record. And if not a smash record, a timeless record, a, a record that, that lives forever. Uh, in the case of Burt, there was always electric in the air. The way he was described on screen with his racing heart and breathing that sal uh, Valsalvo method, he would have a paper bag and put it to his mouth and uh, get that mixture of carbon, di carbon dioxide and oxygen flow so that he won't have those pains in his chest. But that's not making records. That was just the control room of the stuff. Uh, but it, it just, it, we, were, we were always on the edge of our seats with the Burt Burns record, with a handful of our, our, our people, I should say. Uh, the, but to make sure this was a no-nonsense session and the musicianship and the choice of of players, be it a drummer, be it a bass player, be it a keyboard guy, some of the guys you saw on screen, those were pivotal to every session. And we could nail three or four songs, and sometimes you got two hits in a, in, in a day, you know? Wow. And then you don't, at, at most, you'd overdub the strings. We were limited, we had four track machines, so we'd bounce from four track to four track. And once you get that blend, once you get that quote unquote balance, you stuck with it, you lived it, and you died with it because there was no no more room. There what wasn't 32 track or 24 track where you could take care of it later. It was it was on the money or get out, you know. And then sometimes we'd have to overdub the strings and horns and merge those two guys together at another session. And uh, yeah, the operative terms here is uh, you had to be. Keenly aware of the surroundings, keenly aware of Bert, and uh, and uh, they were so exciting. The songs, the material, the artistry, the producers, the room—it was all electric. And uh, you were sitting at the side, you were sitting on the edge of your seat. It wasn't just a lazy day, hanging out here some good groovy music. This was serious shit. Were you like mixing virtually live? I was mixing virtually live. Yeah. 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 Uh, I might add that though we were four track and four track and I was describing it with uh, various multi-track machines, we didn't pay much attention to stereo mixes. We were mixing mono, all mono. So we, it was a commitment. It was like, just, you, you had to commit. You just had to make a decision and commit. And uh, those records to this day sound tremendous because they have that triangle where you hear the band in the back and as it starts to get to the lead singer it triangulates apex in front of you get that apex in front of you and, and that vocal and or solo guitar or horn or horn section just drives the record on home and drives the mix on home yeah wow Sound that's like that. the best description i've ever heard <laughs> Brett, um, oh, okay, uh, see, I knew this was going to happen. Also here, uh, the mayor of Sunset Strip, Rodney Bingenheimer, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, we have to do this. Uh, 
you got to tell me who got left out. Who did you want? Who who, who were you desperate to get? I, I, I know Jimmy Page would have been cool. And explain why why Jimmy was involved at all. Because yeah, um, we got I mean almost everybody on our original wish list, wish, wish list uh, in the film. Uh, it really was remarkable over the course of these ten years. But um, yeah, Jimmy Page, who <clears throat> my dad, you know, he was a session player on those Van Morrison sessions on Baby Please Don't Go, and Here Comes the Night, that's Jimmy Page playing guitar. So Burke brought him back to New York, and uh, he lived with us for six weeks in the penthouse, and my dad was trying to get him a gig at Atlantic, you know, and bang, and a visa to work as a session player, and Ahmet and Jerry were like, what do we need him for? We got Al Gorgoni and uh, you know, Eric Gale and all these guys, and so they refused to give this, you know, young guitar player his uh, visa to work as a session player so you know after changing my diapers a couple times he sent it back to England and um, my dad dies uh, shortly thereafter and Led Zeppelin forms and they record a song called Tribute to Burt Burns and uh, it was the only song on Led Zeppelin's first session uh, album that didn't uh, make the cut and I was one to ask Jimmy why that was the case and I guess it because after what you see what happened here with the uh, Atlantic guys, you know, there wasn't going to be a song called Tribute to Bert Burns on there, Break Me Lat. So, um, but it came out in 93 as a, a derivative uh, work with Jimmy Page, Bert Burns, and Robert Plant, uh, Baby Come On Home. So, uh, yeah, and the other big, uh, you know, obvious, uh, Neil Diamond, you know, um, uh, it wasn't for lack of trying, um, but uh, I also knew that Neil doesn't do these kind of things, and he's very private, and um, so I wasn't, you know, holding my breath, but we tried, and, uh, you know, it's, it's understandable on some levels, you know, he, um, this is a difficult subject matter, he doesn't do these kind of documentaries, but neither does Van Morrison, and he stepped forward, so, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, it would have been great. Yeah, and, and let's talk about that, I mean, I assume there are some Van Morrison fans in the house, I assume I'm not the only one sitting here going, Gee, you met Van Morrison, and you worked with Van Morrison. Um, and you sang background vocals. Huh. And, uh, so they me you might need a new battery. Tell me we're done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, oh, look at that. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs> Bar called the Federal across the street to the right. If anybody wants to have a drink, that's right. Hey, that's rock and roll, baby. Hold that for me, guys. And here we go. A few shots just like that. Perfect. Looking good, fellas. Here we are. One, two, three. Thank you guys. Yeah. When they said you have 30 minutes, they did not mean you have 31 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was brilliant. That was automation taking away. But the question is, thank you. Heartbreaking at the end. I mean, it's just. And that's, that's a sign of a good film, yes. when it can still get you.